Okay. okay, welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amber Towles. I'm actually from the Department of Ethiology and Fishery Science, right next door to SIA. Um, and it's a real honor and privilege today for me to introduce Dr. Taryn Murray. Um, this is both our shared interest. Telemetry is our passion. We've both been doing it for a long time, so it is a real honor when she asked um, to introduce her. Um, so Taryn came to Rhodes back in 2006, and like most of us who registered to do um, MEC and, and PhDs and undergrad at the DIFFs, we never leave. <laughs> and so Taryn is one of those who hasn't left. Um, she's got a serious amount of expertise in fish movement. She did a master's um, using conventional tags and then whole PhD in telemetry, where afterwards she then um, did, started a PVP and she became an instrumental scientist in the acoustic tracking array platform, marine platform. So SIAP has uh, many marine platforms, um, which is absolutely, they, they're amazing platforms um, where uh, a lot of incredible research gets done. And Taryn now manages the marine platform um, called ATAP. ATAP is actually part of a massive global scale large network. Taryn's going to, I'm not going to steal her thunder, she's going to tell you all about what that is and what telemetry is. Um, but it really is to say that Syed or Syed and um, South Africa has really um, put South Africa on the map in terms of these large scale networks. Um, we had just previously Paul Cowley and now Taryn, and it's, it's incredible. So we were at a conference last month, and Taryn was the second talk after the plenary, um, and she really blew um, the audience away with all the amount of amazing information that she provided. Um, and Taryn, I don't know if much of you know about her, she's also an excellent science communicator. Um, she keeps me up to date on Twitter, I'm one of those Twitter stalkers that follows and never tweets, <laughs> but um, make sure to follow her. Um, she's also a magnificent artist, so she's incredible. She's also a mom of two young kids, and she's done extremely well in her scientific career. Um, and I think you are going to be blown away, as I was last month, and um, with this awesome, exciting talk. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Cool. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Anne, for the introduction. Um, okay, let's see if we get things working again. No, nothing. You need to run through everything we could. Yeah, well, no, I can't just now. Sorry, technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, so this talk is the talk that I gave at a conference last month, um, literally almost to the day. So it was actually the 11th of June that I gave my presentation. And this is just that talk because I wanted to share a little bit about what I do and what uh, this multiple uh, collaborative network of researchers, all the research that they're collecting, what it is really uh, working towards. But first of all, the conference was the International Conference on Fish Telemetry. This conference actually started in Europe, so it was a very European-based conference, but then in 2011, they decided to open it up internationally. So it jumped across to Japan, where Amber and uh, Paul Cowley, that you mentioned, who was the previous manager um, and employee at SIAB, they were the first two to attend an international conference. Then we were very fortunate for it to jump down to Makanda in 2013. This was the first international conference I ever went to in Makanda. So it wasn't ex overboard exciting, but <laughs> it was great to have that international exposure being in a comfortable situation. So it was really great. And to be honest, in a completely biased way, it's still the best conference, the international telemetry conference that we've ever been to. Then it jumped across to Canada and Halifax in 2015, down to Australia in 2017, and then up to Norway in 2019. Then the world shut down and mm -hmm. slowly things have opened up. So what I want you to do is jump on a plane with me and fly all the way to over there, to France. That's where the conference was. France, famous for uh, the Apple Tower, baguettes and croissants. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the conference actually took place. This is the Mediterranean Sea and this is set. So this is the place where the conference was and that's roughly where we were based. Um, it's not super picturesque, but that was our place of accommodation, the Mediterranean Sea, so our local swimming spot. And all the way up there was Ephraim 
and that's where the conference was being held. So we used to take beautiful uh, beach walks in the morning up to uh, the conference area. Um, as I mentioned, this was the sixth international conference on fish telemetry and took place last month. And to show that I was actually there, there is photographic yeah. evidence of me giving the exact same talk. So I keep mentioning telemetry. So I thought I'd throw this slide in for people that may not be familiar with what it is. So it's essentially something that works on sound, acoustic telemetry, acoustic is sound. And it's essentially the primary tool worldwide to study fish movement at the moment. So you have um, acoustic uh, fish and you tag them with acoustic transmitters, which are these things over here. They can get up to about this big. And then you've got acoustic receivers that you put in the estuary or the river or the sea or wherever you want to study where your fish are moving. This is what they look like at sea. Over there, this is a unit that will come back to the surface. They can also be scuba dived. Then you've got your fish swimming around, which send out these signals. The tags that you put in them send out signals. And these signals are then picked up by the receivers and record the fish ID, the date, and the time. So by piecing all this information together, you can really start figuring out where these animals are at specific times of the year. So this brings me to the talk, um, which was titled, Do Marine Protected Areas Really Protect Mobile Aquatic Animals? Marine protected areas are really important ecologically, socioeconomically, and um, for climate change mitigation. So they make bigger fish, they make more fish, these fish can move into um, areas that are fished, so you're basically making more fish available for fishing outside of the areas. They're really important from a socioeconomic perspective because um, they are really important for fishermen's livelihoods or people who are impoverished. So that's a good source of food and they can then sell their catch in order to get some income. So they have really multiple benefits of these protected areas. And then there's also recently a lot of work done by Amber and Warren and the Safer Lab at Rhodes University um, about climate change mitigation. So these marine protected areas or MPAs, as I'll call them now, um, actually protect genetics of fish. And they are capable of tolerating these huge changes in temperature better than fish that are fished out. So they've got really important um, uh, benefits in terms of this as well. South Africa currently has 41 marine protected areas, which currently protects 5.5% of our exclusive economic zone. Um, I've included uh, Marion Island down there. We've got a huge part of our EEZ actually lies way offshore of South Africa. Um, 28 of these, or 68%, are currently coastal. And uh, in a perfect world, this would really provide great protection for any animal occurring within their boundaries. But and protecting them from um, activities like fishing, but this doesn't always happen. Amber mentioned the acoustic tracking array platform. So those receivers that I showed you a picture of, this is what our current network of acoustic receivers looks like in South Africa. We cover about 2,200 kilometers all the way down from uh, this, the West Coast, um, mostly False Bay, up to Ponta de Oro over here in Southern Mozambique. The current network has about 265 receivers in it, but this depends on how many studies are on the go at the moment. So we've got some um, intense estuary studies where you plug up an entire area with 10 to 20 receivers. So obviously that number would then change quite a lot. And many of these receivers are actually in a lot of MPAs. 33.2% um, are actually um, receivers are in um, 14 MPAs which goes from Robben Island on the West Coast, which is um, um, <laughs> characterized by these beautiful kelp forests, all the way up to Isimangaliso Wetland Park, where you've got these beautiful soft corals and these incredible subtropical fish. So the position of the receivers within these MPAs actually allows people to get a better understanding of how important these areas are for multiple fish, rays, and shark species. And a lot of the work that has currently been done in South Africa, telemetry work, um, has done a lot of work within these MPAs, specifically these 10. For example, uh, Dr. Bruce Mann led a study uh, on cat-based rock art in the Ponderland MPA, which sits roughly about here on the wild coast. 
And the big take home message is that these fish over here, all PPPP, they were tagged in Ponderland. Blue indicates, or this purple color indicates Ponderland. They didn't move. That's the take home message here. So these fish just stayed in one area. So they were extremely resident to Ponderland MPA. Then you always have exceptions to the rule where you've got some that stay and then decide to go somewhere else completely differently. But that's fish for you. Then very recently, which is super exciting, was Warren actually went out on a boat yesterday to get some um, genetic samples and they kept two Roman. And when they cut them open, both had an acoustic tag in them. So this was actually part of a study that uh, non fish fish had. So they were tagged last year, but they went to the same spot and caught two tagged fish. So if that doesn't show you how much they stay in one area, I really don't know what does, because that is unbelievable. So they've done a lot of work on Roman and Tsitsikama and Kokama MPA, and again, extremely, extremely resident species. Then the Dogwip um, Nature Reserve, a lot of dusky cob, which is one of um, South Africa's very important recreational and subsistence targeted species. They attain a really big size, um, was tagged in um, the Breda estuary, which is over here. The animation's a little bit um, stagnated, but use your imagination. So the, the black dots here represent dusky cob that were tagged within the Dogwip MPA, which is this red outline. And the colored dots indicate fish that were tagged within the estuary. But what's important to note is that the colored dots are moving all over the place. But the ones tagged within the estuary, uh, within the MPA stay there. So again, it's highlighting the importance of these areas for these fish that not only move, but the ones that live there. So we know that MPAs are great for resident fish. These guys, they have very small home ranges. They stay in one place. What about mobile species? What, what about the ones that move hundreds to thousands of kilometers? So for the purpose of this study, we looked at um, acoustic detection data that was collected by this acoustic receiver network um, on six mobile species. So these are species that are capable of undertaking these long migrations, and they generally come back to a certain area. So these six species were tagged by researchers at SIAD and include bronze whaler shark um, and the bull shark, the duck bull ray and the diamond ray, and then Leophis and um, giant, sorry, giant rebelli or giant kingfish. Don't get caught up on this um, probably overwhelming plot, but the big take home message is you've got your pink dots and your blue dots. Pink is MPA. So do they occur in MPAs? And the answer is yes, but to varying degrees. So you've got some animals like the giant uh, kingfish down here that seems to spend or be detected on receivers that are MPA, in MPAs compared to the diamond ray that is mostly out of MPAs. What about movements between MPAs? Are individuals actually moving from one MPA to another to another? And overwhelmingly, again, don't decipher these. It's literally just a visual thing. The answer is yes, but again, to varying degrees and depending on where an animal was tagged. So for bronze whaler sharks, example, uh, for example, they were mostly tagged down here. So before I be begin, blue indicates MPAs within the Western Cape, gray is MPAs within the Eastern Cape, and red is MPAs within um, KZN. So a lot of the bronze whalers were tagged down in the Western Cape, and you can see that a lot of the movements were between MPAs within the in the Western Cape and the Gray, which is the Eastern Cape. Compare that down here to giant trevally or giant kingfish, they were mostly tagged in KZN. And this is more or less their distribution range. This is where they found in South Africa. So of course, their circle here is only going to be, only going to be red with a little bit of gray. So it, it, it's very species specific, and again, dependent on where the animals are tagged. So what about um, actual connectivity between MPAs? If you look at these three species, bull sharks, uh, duck bull rays, and your dying kingfish. Again, there is good movement between the MPAs, but it seems to be a lot of movements between specific MPAs. And again, this result is really linked to where these animals were tagged. For example, duck bull rays, a lot of them were tagged down in the Western Cape by the Hoop MPA and Robert. And that's where you're seeing a lot of these movements happening. Also, a big batch was tagged in Algoa Bay down in um, Kabetha down the road. 
So uh, even though there is connectivity between or among a lot of MPAs, it's really quite dependent on where these animals were tagged. So there is some degree of these animals staying in certain areas. Um, so we then looked at running um, a generalized additive mix model on looking at the days detected um, or looking at whether the species spent more time detected on receivers with inside MPAs or outside MPAs. Again, quite varied, but duck bull rays and GTs came out tops in terms of MPAs, where bull sharks and leophorus, for example, spent a lot of time or recorded mostly outside MPAs. And looking at seasonally, this very again differs per species. Bronze whaler seems to be in MPAs in areas more in the summer months, drops down in winter, and peaks up again where your bull sharks and your learies show no pattern at all. I mean, that's literally a flat line. The fish are not dead. It's just this. <laughs> um, okay, so in conclusion, the degree of connectivity is largely dependent on tagging regions. So in order to try and account for this, you really need to try and focus on tagging individuals throughout their distribution, because some fish in certain parts might do something quite different to animals in other parts. Um, overall, Protection provided by the MPAs is relatively low for these mobile species, but while they're in the areas, they are very much protected. So that is an added bonus. And as we saw from the, the seasonal trends, um, some of them are protected more at certain times during the year. So that's a really great, a great result. Um, so the core scale network, um, the acoustic tracking array platform takes a pin prick approach. So a lot of the time you have one receiver somewhere along the coastline. It's not necessarily enough to collect a whole bunch of movement information. So we, it's, it's quite coarse scale in terms of it's uh, the amount of information you collect or the type of information you can collect. But if you had to tweak this network and really clog up certain areas, you could actually collect really fine scale movement information on these species. And you would be able to answer then how much time are they actually afforded when they're MPAs? We know that they're there, but how much time are they actually spending with M in MPAs? Um, so the, the question should really be, should these coastal networks, because we are one of many across the world, should we be able to adapt to really answer these kinds of questions? Um, because at the end of the day, this movement information can be used or collected for improved management um, of, these, of these species. Um, before I close this talk, there's a couple of slides coming out. I just want to really acknowledge all the deployment collaborators who help us maintain the ATAP network. Without them, we would not have this functional network, and they form an absolutely integral part on how we manage the platform. So a big shout out to all our, our collaborators. So that's the business end of the talk. Uh, the fun part of the talk is just showing you some beautiful pictures because it was a really scenic place. Um, set seem to have these incredible canal systems everywhere um, with beautiful boats. And this was actually a walk home from La Ola. So it was one of the restaurants on the beach. Um, the one night, beautiful Mediterranean Sea. Um, it seemed a little bit dirty, but maybe I'm just biased <laughs> from our like beautiful golden sand beaches, um, but very picturesque. Um, incredible murals that we kept coming across. And um, this was just off. I don't even know what it was, maybe like a little shop or, or something, but really great, uh, beautiful fish art. Um, this was the restaurant that we had our big conference dinner at, uh, La Ola, it was on the beach. Um, and yeah, it was just spectacular. It helps that it was peak summer, so it was beautiful, and then we get back to ice cold winter. So it was a great um, break from the, the icy weather. Um, this was at a... Uh, fish rest or no it was a seafood buffet type thing but it was mostly crustaceans I partook in some bread and some um, hummus I think because I'm not a bread muscle or shellfish eater but um, yeah it was, it was really great and uh, get some good travel buddies to go with me so um, Amber as you can see features in in the photos and then um, over here we've got Dr. Chantal Elston who is currently working with uh, the ATAP as a postdoctoral fellow so um, it's, it's great having some really cool companions to, to travel with too. And for those who are starting their scientific career or thinking about going into a scientific career, one of the nice things is that you touch base with people. 
This was in our um, conference here in Makanda in 2013, and we got to catch up again 10 years later. So it's really nice to be able to keep seeing these people and keep going back um, to people or touching base with people that you haven't seen in a very long time. Um, because this is a talk, I'm giving a punt for another talk. Please join my other talk. <laughs> Um, this is on the 17th of August. It's an online event. Um, I'll share the details with Lucky, who I'm sure will distribute around. But um, please join, it, join me for learning more about um, the secret movements of aquatic animals and uh, what the ATAP has told us about um, all these animals. And um, I don't know where I am the time. Let me go along. And then, uh, yes, join our social media, please. <laughs> uh, but with that, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Taryn. Um, I was still sitting there going, oh, I love this information so much because really it's just incredible. You can't, how do you understand where things go, how they move, what are their drivers of their movement without tracking them? So this is such a fun stuff. So yeah, thank you so, so much. And that was absolutely amazing. Um, okay, should we open up for questions? Um, got a first question here um, from Iqbal. Is there any bias with number of acoustic receivers and distances between area that place in NPAs and non-NPAs? Yeah, yeah. So um, yes, there will definitely be some kind of a bias. So in order to really gain a better understanding of how much time or how efficient these areas are, you should ideally have the same number of receivers within an NPA and probably to either side adjacent to that NPA so that you can get a better idea of the movements. Um, uh, within and out between uh, from inside and outside of the the MPA um, it's also very tricky to place receivers in correct positions to account for really inshore species so for example the leophis that I mentioned as well as a couple of the ray species swim really 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 close inshore telemetry is a bit at a loss in terms of uh, really shallow deployments South Africa is extremely um uh what's the word i'm looking for um, high energy, high energy uh, wave it's, it's a high energy environment so the the receivers not only will be hammered by waves in these shadow areas but the sound generated by the waves will be really really high so the receivers will struggle to listen for the tags but yes in a perfect world you need to have receivers pretty much adjacently spaced or equally spaced within these different environments to really gain a better understanding of how um how much time and where they are and yeah. Hopefully we're moving towards. Okay. Yeah, and I'm actually starting a great uh, care zone project where uh, we're looking at potentially um, using catch and release or creating protected areas, but that are catch and release. So you're still providing a safety net for fish, but you're still providing the fishing opportunities that uh, people will very strongly oppose to giving up. And and yeah, some inch we put some receivers yeah, in the uh, sand, yeah. sandy areas, which should work quite well. Um, then we've got from the science communication guru himself, Professor Judy Mann, who says, love your graphics. Excellent science. Thank, Thank you, Judy. Um, yeah. And then Sandia said, completely agree, very effective tool. We've got Alice, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Okay, any questions on the floor in person? Yes, Francesca. Yes. Uh, Judy took my comments and compliments to your graphics. Great talks and great graphics. But uh, from your response, would you suggest then that, especially for mobile spaces, the solution for MPAs is rather to have several smaller MPAs where when the spaces are present in the MPAs, like you said, they will receive uh, protection or what? Before you answer, I'm going to repeat Francesca's question to the online audience. Oh, everyone heard. Okay, no worries. <laughs> um, for mobile species, probably, but they would still need to be of a relatively decent size to account for movement. Some of these species move exceptionally quickly, especially when they're on their migrations. So uh, moving up to KZN, a lot of the fish move from Western Cape, Eastern Cape, as you know, up to KZN to spawn or to feed or whatever it may be. The trip back down is a little bit slower. So on the way back, they might be a little bit more protected than what they would be going up because those speeds are so much faster. Um, but if you had these small, equally spaced little MPAs along, they probably would be afforded quite a nice amount of detection. 
but the current network does account for those residency times, which is when they really, really are uh, protected. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think a series going forward of dedicated studies, like you said, is really yeah. going to answer what you said because you could be without knowledge of where fish move, it's very hard to design appropriately mm -hmm. size and games. Okay, any other questions? Do you have a question? Yes, yes. Lovely talk, Taryn. Uh, thank you so much for explaining your telemetry um, information even to someone who's working on very slow moving things. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering, how do you how do you capture I saw shark in your telemetry stuff? How do you handle shark? Because I'm assuming they're still alive. Yes. And are you selecting the ones that are not dangerous or was just one? So bull sharks are one of the, um, for lack of a better word, please don't quote me on this, people are like deadliest. Um, sharks, they're just, there's been a, they've been responsible for a lot of shark human uh, interactions. So um, they, they are fairly dangerous. Uh, but uh, we've had some good help from the shark wranglers who do a lot of shark telemetry um, work. But from my understanding, I've never, I've unfortunately never been involved with tagging one of the sharks. But I know with the bull sharks uh, in Mozambique, I've, I've been with one of the researchers there. They generally catch them, but they've got to have a big rubber mat over the side of the boat because sharks have bitey ends that bite things and they um, actually ended up losing a pontoon on one of their rubber ducks once because a tiger shark bit the side but they have these big rubber mats that they kind of push over the side so that the animal because uh, sharks have a really rough sandpaper skin as well and um, so it protects the boat and then they've got a hook on the one thing so obviously however they've caught it um, and they kind of managed to get a rope around the tail and bring it alongside the boat and they kind of flip it over and once it is on its back, it goes into tonic immobility, which is um, essentially like the fish goes to sleep. So it just kind of stops moving and stays still. They can do the surgery and then flip it back over and comes right and away and swims. So, yeah. Sharks, uh, fish, fish and rays are easier to, well, rays are stingy things on the end. So. <laughs> but uh, they're much easier to handle than, than the big sharks. Okay, before I open up to the floor again, we've got three online questions. Um, the first is from Ivana. says, love the presentation. My questions are, one, will the recording be made available to the attendees? Yes, yes they, it will. Um, how? Uh, by YouTube, okay. Two, how do the finding around Marion Island EPA compare to the SA Coastline EPAs, considering the difference in anthropogenic noise pollution? Okay, so that was easy to answer. We have no <laughs> listening power around Marion Island. Um, it would be amazing to do some work there, but the species are completely different around Marion Island. So uh, something that the future might potentially hold, but at the moment, no difference. We don't know because uh, we don't have any listening power in Marion Island. Thanks, thanks, T. And then we've got from Melissa, thank you. Looking forward to the next talk. Sandhya said, do you think there'll be a trend in terms of breeding ground selection in NPAs versus non-NPAs? Um, interesting question, but I don't think that aquatic animals can really delineate boundaries. Um, if they could, that would be great. You could like whisper in their ears and say, by the way, this is like a safe space. Maybe you should go there. That would, that would be ideal, but in a perfect world, uh, well, that's in a perfect world, but unfortunately I don't think it will, um, help that much. For example, with the dusky cob that I mentioned earlier, um, the Breda estuary is really one of their last um, population strongholds. It's a very heavily depleted species. It's only about 2% of what there once was um, left. And that area is really, really important for the breeding population. So at least while they're in the Dukup MPA, they are really protected, um, but they will still go offshore to spawn and then move back in. So, uh, yeah, it would be great if we could do that, but unfortunately, I don't think it'll work like that just yet. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then an anonymous attendee said, what are fisheries management, what types of, of fisheries management in place within the NPAs? Are they catch limits or species specific protection? Okay, so um, there are general fishery, fisheries regulations in South Africa which uh, stipulate how many fish you can catch and how big that fish needs to be. Within MPAs, you get multiple different types of MPAs. So you get some that are completely no take, which means no fishing of any kind. You get others that allow um, some fishing, like offshore fishing, 
but not necessarily bottom fishing. Um, so it's dependent on the NPA and the regulations within it, but overarching the overarching fisheries regulations still apply. Okay, thanks. Please let us know if this answers to all your questions. You're welcome to um, yeah, reply via chat. Uh, oh, another one by Alice. Uh, does telemetry assist with calculating the age of fish? Um, not in isolation, but what it can do is uh, if you're still getting a, a tag. So the, the tag that I showed earlier, I'm gonna I don't know if the online people can see it. Yeah. That tag over there. Um, zoom in. Um, this one can go for 10 years. So if you put this inside an animal, it will go for uh, for ten years. So if you're still clinging, if your animal is still sending out detections for um, ten years time, you at least know that that fish is 100 percent at least ten years age, ten years old. But to age it, um, if you've got the length, you can maybe back help, back calculate an age, but you won't have the exact age of the animal. Thank you. And then Ivana said, "Thank you for your answers. I'm currently using acoustic." picked up by the Marion Island hydrophone to study baleen whales. So this is very interesting. Um, Ivana, awesome. I think you and I need to talk because yeah. uh, we're wanting to put hydrophones on our moorings. So um, please reach out to me so we can make some connections. Awesome. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. It's, it's not about these species. Um, has some other work done, been done with um, Trawled or percent fish populations and MPAs? Um, so there isn't work on many of the commercial species at the moment, just because of a high recapture rate. We're hoping to branch out into silver cob and yellowtail, which are both um, he well heavily exploited, but in better conditions. So we're hoping to do that. Um, but otherwise, in terms of uh, commercially exploited, not not present. A lot of them are a little bit through the offshore as well. And internationally. But globally they are. Yes, glo glo globally 100 percent There is so much work done on um Atlantic um cod and also the all the salmon and the trout that like move in and out, the eels. So there's a, a lot of work that is done there. Okay. It's just not in South Africa. And and, and, and interactions with MPA is there. Um not I haven't come across a lot of studies yeah. have confirmed it. One, one of the talks is actually in the um, Mediterranean. Yes. It's just started to look at the um, potential of um, area use within yeah. MPAs, a number of different fishery species. So we found that actually quite interesting because there hasn't really been that much focus as it has you know, in some other. Yeah, there, there was a, a recent study on uh, ragged tooth sharks, but obviously they're not a commercially exploited species, but um, in Australia on the east coast. So they've got a couple of MPAs there because they're um, quite a heavily depleted population. And that is one of very few that I've off the top of my head come across that look at movements within um, and between MPAs. The Portuguese have also done quite a lot of work on that, but not commercially exploited species besides the, the cod population in, um, in Europe and North America. Great question worth exploring. Yeah. The uptake of this research into spatial layers to inform mm -hmm. uh, new MPAs. So uh, the the latest area that telemetry data has been incorporated in is the systematic conservation plan for sharks and rays and um, that the Wild Trust was developing. So it was basically a, a big plan for uh, elasmobranch species, which are shark and rays. Um, specifically focusing on Southern African endemics and threatened species. So some of the work went to that. We, we have some data on some of those animals, obviously not a lot of them. Um, and we hopefully going to see some uptake of the dusky cob work in the Breda um, into an uh, updated plan, a prediction plan for them. So that would be really good. The data is here. People just need to ask. And, and, and um, we need to be a bit proactive in terms of approaching people that uh, we can use the data. Um, at the moment, they're also looking at important shark and ray areas. There's um, applications going in that you can propose important shark and ray areas, and uh, we're hopefully going to try and incorporate um, some of the telemetry data for the Western Indian Ocean, um, important shark and ray area. Yes. <laughs> and we, we're currently doing um, looking at tagging inshore um, marine shore based fishery species and then to, using a movement layer and then we're using catch unit effort yeah. um, as another layer and then identifying species hotspots and species distribution models. So that's all going into essentially looking at 
new proposed areas for our inshore fishery species that aren't really a shore-based fishery species. Come on, any other <laughs> questions? Yes, I'll look. I'm turning uh, from a freshwater taxonomy. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your presentation. I, I'm just curious about the difference in the movement patterns of the, I think it's dusk cotton mm -hmm. in the radar estuary mm -hmm. that it seems as if some of the animals did not move that much, but there was some movement uh, from some of the individuals. What could be the, the, the reason for the difference? I, I'm just thinking that you think that, uh, or have there been any studies that have been done that look at uh, alteration in the behavior of patterns through the taking process. So Amber did this on Dusky Carp in the Sunday's history. Um, and it actually turns out that there are different contingents. So you pretty much have an estuary contingent and a marine contingent. And they intermingle, but they kind of do their own thing. So the marine ones will, as you saw, it was difficult with the animation, but the black dots pretty much stay where they were and maybe make a little trip and come back and chill where the other ones were like moving and moving. And the thought might be that the fish that were resident in the estuary are gone. So all you've got are the movers within the estuary and they also have to adapt to, to these huge fluctuations in environmental temperatures. You've got different um, temperatures and salinities and everything else involved in the estuary. So they have to move um, in order to survive a little bit more than this, the fish that only live in the sea. But yeah, Amber did exactly this uh, in the Sundays and found that just that. Which is why we're doing physiology to try and understand these drive layoffs because we found with the marine populations more stable and didn't have that type of movement as we did in the estuaries. And we thought it gets temperature and dissolved oxygen that's actually driving this movement. So they'll come into the estuary after a big up coastal upwelling and then go out of the estuary when it's warm summer temperatures. Mm -hmm. Another one, yes, uh, Nikki, great talk, Tara. And how much non reef habitat, which is important for sharks and rays, is covered by NPAs? I'm not actually sure. I'm just running through the NPAs in my head. Uh, I think Isamangaliza covers quite a lot of sandy areas. They're quite uh, varied in terms of their habitats. I'll go Bay. It's quite sandy. So, yeah. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. And yeah exactly, exactly. So, there, there are areas. So, even though these animals move a lot, um, they are in specific areas. So, for example, your rays um, or your wedgefish. So, like the giant um, guitar, your white spotted wedgefish, and your lesser guitar fish. The sandy areas like Algoa Bay, not so much the, the white spotted wedgefish, they don't really come down this way. But for the, the lesser sandies and the eagle rays, uh, even blue stingrays, those will be really important uh, within Algoa Bay because it's beautiful sandy habitat for them. So that NPA is really important for that species. Where you might have something like uh, Table Mountain National Park or Roburg or um, yeah, Ponderland that might be more important for bronze whalers moving up and down because it's quite reef associated. And um, I think there would be more fish opportunities in terms of like fish abundance there. So yeah, again, I think it depends on um, the MPA and the species. So here's another online question from Alwande. How is acoustic telemetry contributing to our understanding of the behavior or movement patterns of the study organism? How does acoustic telemetry compare to other tracking methods such as satellite tra tracking? Okay, so to answer your second question first, Satellite tracking is great. You can really get some super fine scale information. However, it is limited to species that break the surface of the water. So this is why it's generally used on things like sharks, turtles, and some really large sport fish like your tuna. And even uh, the Australians are doing yellowtail um, kingfish as well. So they also break the water. Giant kingfish break the water. So they need to break the water in order to for their tag to emit this little satellite which is unfortunately what a lot of our species that we study do not do. Um, so that is why we've used acoustic telemetry because it allows us to study um, any kind of species. And it is also, uh, it's not cheap, but it's cheaper than satellite um, telemetry because one satellite has about 45,000 Rand. Um, so it is a, it's a very expensive game. Um, then in terms of the understanding of the behavior or movement patterns of fish, it has been an absolute game changer. Uh, the Oceanographic Research Institute um, has a cooperative fish tagging program 
that they run um, where fishermen can get dart tags and then they can go and they can tag an animal. It's like a little plastic tag that sticks out of the animal. However, this information relies on the fish needing to be recaptured. So you only have two points in time where telemetry now fills in the gaps. So you now know where, you know, if that fish was in Cape Town and went to PE, it's actually stopped at Plate and Jehoop on the way. So it really allowed us to, to um, answer these movement questions. And what it's also allowed us to do is to tie in with environmental variables. So you now know how temperature might affect an animal because if it's in a certain area, this is like a lot of the estuary work that we've done where uh, you can actually start linking those movements to specific environmental variables and you really know what, the, what is driving the behavior of that animal. So yes, it's been great. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And then uh, Sanya said, your use of tagging application to MPA characterizations is amazing. What do you think a similar model would be effective in terrestrial mammal tracking movement? Uh, yes. So in um, in terrestrial work, you get radio telemetry, uh, which you can actually do on fish as well. But it's essentially the same thing. You've essentially got an uh, animal moving around with a tag on it or a collar or whatever it may be. And somebody is tracking that animal. So you've got uh, essentially the same information. My understanding is that a lot of the, the tracking work that has been done has actually in South Africa has been linked to these protected areas. It's easier to kind of do it within park boundaries, especially on animals like cheetahs and lions and leopards. Um, but I think that there is definitely scope for, for work on, on other animals. Um, I'm just not that familiar with it. Um, land is a little bit out of my comfort zone. I, like, I prefer the sea. <laughs> so I can't answer that question um, exceptionally well. Apparently dragonflies have been tagged. Yeah. <laughs> we found that out of the sun school. <laughs> cool. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah. Oh, last one. Sorry. Um, I was just curious about the two red Roman that were unfortunately yes. sacrificed. Yeah, I was just thinking that considering the active uh, pro uh, project or program is to for long term monitoring. Is it is it not possible for you to put uh, an outside tag on the fish that have been tagged just as a marker so that when people recapture that, they, that can act as an indication that actually we contain the tag rather than okay, yeah. kill it for you to find out. Yeah. I'm just thinking for long term monitoring. So yeah. one of the one of the the the, the um, initial thoughts of of marking them was to place additional stress on the animals. So now you've got something in your back and you've had something put into your stomach. So it was like an additional stress factor. Um, fishermen or people in general are sometimes quite curious. And if they see something, they go, oh, I wonder what I wonder what it is. And they'll kill your fish anyway to find out what it is. So there's also that aspect to it. But the initial thought was an additional stress factor. A lot of the shark guys actually tag, they put a, a tag into the animal, uh, like one of the RE tags. Um, and have an acoustic transmitter, just they, they're more robust and a bit capable of, of handling things a little bit better. And then other animals like the stingrays don't even try tagging them with a the dart tag. They're going to shed it in a, in a matter of months. So the red Roman was a special case because <laughs> can I yeah. Yeah. So um, we tagged them with accelerometer tags, which uh, measured the tailbeam frequency to look at activity. And those tags, when you, you can add like sensors to these transmitters, so they can be like temperature or dissolved oxygen and acceleration. So they only last a very short while. So like five months at a time. So those tags were dead for over a year now. Um, and why those ones were kept is when they were doing genetic sampling, um, we're actually looking for scars because we want to validate field metabolic rates. So now we've got the acceleration um, at, and the activity at thermal extremes. And so those oatless of those fish are going to be sent to Cloud Truman in Southampton to use for validation for field metabolic rate. So we've got uh, six months of amazing data of um, temperature and activity. And now apparently you can pick up field metabolic rate, but it hasn't been validated. So those two were sacrificed for validation. Normally we would not do that, we would leave them in and, and, yeah, and, and leave them swim around. Um, we would never go and, and keep the fish, but that was the reason for why those were sacrificed. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? School learners, anything interesting? Did you enjoy that? Did you? Awesome. Okay. Is that a wrap? Oh, no, sorry, he has another one.
Sipilele, sorry, do you assess the health of the fish before tagging them with the acoustic transmitter in order to know that they will last for the study period? Yes, absolutely. We take, we try and take the best care that we can of the fish because it's in our interest and obviously the fish's interest very much so as well. Um, if they display any signs of stress, then we release them uh, back into the wild or wherever you caught them, to so sea or estuary or river. Um, how you know they're stressed is that maybe the, the fish start losing a little bit of scales and you go, mm, this guy's not going to make it, he's not looking good. So you let that animal go again. And if anything goes wrong during the surgery process, you stitch him up and send him on his way. You don't pose the additional stress of a tag because it's just not, it's not worth it. Yeah. Well, then that's a wrap. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, yeah, it was really great. And thank you, everyone, on our online audience. Um, thank you for all your questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>